Let's put this up. One of my favorite Disney Pixar movies, movie of all time, is definitely Finding Nemo. I listen to this every Saturday. This, this is when uh, Marlin sees Finding Nemo, not Finding, but Nemo as an egg from that perspective of the father. Okay, that's enough sappiness. Okay, so, I mean, Pixar, I don't know one bad movie Pixar made, but if Pixar made a character, my favorite character in Finding Nemo has to be Dory. <laughs> Dory is this incredibly adorable blue fish, but very forgetful fish that uh, tries to help Marlin find Nemo but her problem is that she forgets everything and anything in three seconds time. But I think that's why she's funny. Because, you're, I mean, it doesn't really make sense to bring someone that forgets everything to try to find someone. I think that's the brilliance of Pixar. It's just pure comedy. And if you, have, if you haven't seen it, that's a 180 sin. <laughs> this is a movie you need to rent tonight and watch it, okay? Because it's a great movie. But um, Dory has a problem of for, you know, basically forgetting everything around her. She has a hard time remembering who her friends are, who, where her family is, where she is. She forgets those who love her, those who have spoken to her. She basically forgets everything. And in the same way, I think that's the story humanity, most of us in this room, find ourselves in. We have this incurable epidemic of forgetfulness. And it doesn't matter how hard you try to remember anything. But most of the time, we forget, except those painful things that we try to forget. But we're not talking about that today. That's a whole different story. But you, you try to hold on to beautiful memories that you have in your life. If I said, what are three beautiful memories in your life that you remember? Could you, in an instant, recollect them and, and feel them and see the colors and feel the, you know, the whole climate of that moment? You probably wouldn't be able to. You just see some images in your head. And the problem with, with humanity is that for most of us, no matter how beautiful something is, if it's in the past, it's in the past. It, we have a hard time holding on to it. And then at the same time, we have a problem in the moment of appreciating what's going on. And I said in the end today that we don't do carpe diems. Like I always say, we do what? Carpe? Mania. We regret, oh, I should have. I should have done that. I should have said this. We, re we live in regret. We don't seize the moment. So for most of the time, we live in a spirit of forgetfulness. And that's why our main problem in life, why we're not content with our life and always want more, is because we can't remember and can't, because we can't remember, we're very ungrateful. If you can't, the problem of forgetfulness is the root of it is really ungratefulness. We can't remember the people that love us and were there for us. We forget very easily. And here's the problem with that. The problem with forgetting is that if you want to, con you, you want to have a life of contentment. How many people in this room want to be happy? Amen. But you're never going to be fully happy. We know that. This is not heaven. I'm talking about content, meaning you, when you wake up in the morning, you wake up with an attitude of thankfulness that you're alive, that you have people in your life, that you have a story to live, that God has given you this breath. When you can wake up that way, it means that you have enough. I live like that. Do you want to live like that? You can't if you are forgetful. But the, the human epidemic is that humanity, we're selfish by innately, and we forget people that are there for us and are good to us, and we want something right now. And that's why the Bible talks about where the gospel comes in. The gospel comes in and seeks to redeem this part of us, called what I call spiritual amnesia. Spiritual amnesia is a condition where you can't remember, therefore can't be happy or grateful. Your life is mostly a blur. 
And you cannot seem to grasp why you should be thankful for what you have. And that's why the Bible says, with very painful repetition in the Bible, over and over again, God says to His people, do not forget the... What does it say? Do not forget the Lord, your God, when you come into the land... It says, yeah, when, when you come into the land flowing with milk and honey. What, what does that sound like to you? When milk is flowing and honey is flowing, it sounds like success. When your life is going well... Most of the time, we forget the people that brought us there. And it says, and, and God says this, do not, do not forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, or who brought you out of darkness, who was there for you, provided for you. But the problem is, we always do. We forget God for delivering us, and we forget the people that love us. And this is a big, humongous problem. Because if you want a beautiful life, if you want a life of contentment, and you want a life that's enough, you want to have meaning and purpose and live in beauty, then you have to tackle this issue. So this is how the gospel transcends ungratefulness. How many people want to be grateful people today? Amen. That's what the gospel transformed. And then you're like, not really. I just want more stuff. That's the path of destruction. It's the path of discontentment. Always wanting more. Okay. So let's turn to our passage here. And I think we can learn a couple lessons to help us overcome the spirit of ungratefulness. Overcome always forgetting the most important things in life. And the gospel comes in, Jesus comes in from the very beginning of Genesis and helps us remember God and the people around us. Amen? So, so look at this. Matt, with his beautiful manly voice, read it for us. But what you need to catch from Genesis 12, verse 6, 6 to 7, is really simple. Verse 7 said, The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give you this land. And then I want all of us to read the underline together in, in, a, in a loud voice, in unison. Now that might be a challenge for Asian people. But let's try that. Okay? Now, so he built an altar there. Okay, let's try it again. God forgives you for reading the Bible that way. It's okay. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. All right, not bad, not bad. It was like a couple of beats off, but you know, it's all right. But so Abraham built an altar there to the Lord. Who had appeared to him. You ever wonder why? The question is, what is an altar? And when you read the Old Testament, why is there an altar? If you read Genesis 13, Abraham built another altar in Bethel. Then he built another altar somewhere else. And another altar. And then the Israelites built altars. And, you know, then you go to the New Testament, they built altars. And then churches built altars. We have an altar right here or a pulpit. There's altars everywhere in the Bible. I mean, why? I mean, does God like altars? Okay, so first question, let's answer it, okay? What is an altar? Ancient Mesopotamia here, an altar is what? Rocks. It's not beautiful. It's just a bunch of little rocks. And what do you do? You pile them up together. That's how you build an altar. Okay, so, okay, so Abraham built an altar. He puts rocks on top of rocks. And then he said he built an altar to who? Now, what if I went home today and brought some rocks and said, honey, look, this is my love for you. And she goes, um, what is that for? I built an altar because like they built an altar in the Bible, so it must be good. I mean, what is the obsession with altars? Well, God doesn't care about rocks. And when people pass by those rocks, when, people, when you pass by a cemetery and the stone has a name on it, and, and you have no relation to that person that died there, when you pass by that cemetery, it means nothing to you. It's not sacred. You have no recollection. You have no memory. But when the people that have known those people in those stones come visit that place, it's sacred, isn't it? 
The rocks, the stones in Scripture are there for Abram to remember how he met God. Amen? Right? It's, it's for us. That's why we build something. So we can remember what happened. Now, let me explain it to you this way. My son is a pure genius. I'm not saying that because, I mean, some parents have this thing about boasting about their kids. Now, me, I was going to be honest about my kid, okay? If my kid was ugly, and I'm sorry to tell you, some babies are just ugly. You know, people, the whole babies are so cute. But listen, when they come out and they're covered in slime, which I've seen, and whatever that thing is around their body, they're not cute. But my son was. And let me tell you, I am being totally 100% objective about it. My son is a beautiful baby. I mean, of course, look at the genetics. Genetic makeup, I mean, it's going to come out that way. And you know, but if, if it wasn't, I would have been honest about it and said, honey, we have to prepare him for 180 scholarship. He's not good looking, so he has to be smart. <laughs> but you know, we don't have to worry about that because he's smart and good looking, like his dad and mom. Anyway, let's pass by that part real quick. So on the day Nathan was born, you know, most fathers and most mothers, Usually, to remember the occasion, they'll probably bring a disposable camera or an iPhone. Well, iPhones didn't exist yet, I think. No, it, didn't. it wasn't released yet. Or maybe it was. I don't remember. It was like almost three years ago. And so they told me, you know, Lydia, she was, Pastor Lydia, she was in labor. She was like screaming. And, I'm go and, and you know, what I decided to do was I was not going to be one of those fathers that missed this type of monumental moment in my son's life. I was going to document. I was going to be one of those annoying dads that document everything, that save everything, that know everything. So what I decided to do when, you know, she was like, ah, she was in labor, and this annoying medical student was there, intern was there, trying to help her and stuff, trying to get in there. And I just left her for a second to get my laptop. Because the MacBook has iPhoto, right? The photo booth. And I didn't have a camera. So I was going into the delivery room with my MacBook. And the doctors were going in, and we're all going in. The doctor was like, dude, they were like, what are you doing, sir? I'm like, what do you mean? I'm going to take a picture of this thing. <laughs> so while Nathan was being born, I took my MacBook. And you know, if you have a Mac, you know, you have to go like this in different kind of angles. So my wife was, you know, giving labor, and I had my MacBook like this. And when Nathan came out, I went, click, and I took a picture of him in his filth, in his, all that crap on him. But you know what? He was beautiful. It was a beautiful moment. Let me tell you, they built altars in the Old Testament, the same reasons why you and I take pictures. Why do we take pictures? Why do some of you just love taking pictures of yourself, like my wife? <laughs> If you look at my photo booth, it's 90% my wife taking pictures of herself. <laughs> like this. <laughs> One outfit, different outfit, different scenery, change of scenery. She's just taking pictures of herself. You know, it's like, you know, it's, you can like play like a book on it, you know, if you did fast enough. I mean, obsession with taking pictures of yourself. I mean, there are people who love taking pictures. I mean, uh, our staff went to Puerto Rico one time. Henry, he has an obsession with taking pictures. He took a picture. He bought a Polaroid. I don't know. He, I think he paid $30 for that without telling me. I'm going to beat him up. <laughs> he bought this waterproof Polaroid with, with all these guys in the water below, looking blown up, holding each other. No homo. But they were hugging each other. And, and you know, the only person that looks exactly the same is John. John looks exactly the same. John is like this. Everybody else is sort of bigger or smaller. And you know, they're there smiling. And Henry takes this picture and he blows it up and puts it on, you know, this big type of, you know, album kind of thing, you know, his artsy side. And when you look at the picture, you go, that was a great moment. But we wouldn't have remembered it if we didn't take a picture of it, would we have? We would have forgotten about all those moments. Because for humanity, we forget very quickly, even if something was immensely fun. 
or some immensely beautiful. We forget. We forget over and over again because it is in our nature to not look back. It is in our nature to be effed up, to be broken, to be ungrateful and selfish. Unless, like Abraham, you build altars or you take pictures, you're not going to remember the beautiful things that happened in your life. So, how do you transcend? How do you overcome the spirit of ungratefulness that's in all of us? How does the gospel help us overcome it? Well, the first lesson, Abram teaches us with a bunch of rocks. It's a very profound lesson. What is that? The first lesson we learned to overcome the spirit of ungratefulness is what? Make something that what? what? That will help you remember. Now, for some of you in this room, you don't know God. You're just trying to discover who God is. You're trying to discover who Jesus is. For some of you, you have none of these memories with God. Or some of you, you do. The great thing about buying a camera and the great thing about the rocks, they're everywhere. You can go right now in the parking lot and get some rocks right now. There are rocks available. You can get them for free. The camera is expensive, more expensive, but rocks are free. So if you're poor, go get some rocks. If you're richer, go get a digital camera. Because, listen, you're not going to remember beautiful moments when people love you, when people are there for you. When people love you or buy you a meal and you want to be a grateful person, what the gospel is saying is at that moment, take a camera out, take a picture of it, post it in your refrigerator, and then next week, buy that person that bought you a meal, another meal, and give back. The gospel here is telling us the only way humanity can break its ungratefulness is to create something to help you as a reminder, a powerful reminder as what has happened. So today, let me ask you a question. With God in your life, where are your altars and where are your pictures? You have none? Go make some. Get some rocks. Get a camera. Make some memories. Because listen, here is the powerful thing about the Bible. How many people hear that the Bible is the Word of God? And you're like, and you, you know, you go to church, and the pastor tells you, the Word of God. You're supposed to believe the Word of God. You know, and especially if you say God, that way it's more powerful. That's more authority. It's the Word, it's the word of God. You don't, you don't, you know, drop your Bible. Listen, listen to me very clearly before I move on. The Bible, listen to me. The Bible in its print form is just a book written by human beings. The Bible did not fall from the sky. Like Muhammad says about the Quran. Muhammad says the, the Quran fell from the sky. And, G, and, and God gave it to him. How do, I, how do I know if he wasn't on drugs? It came from heaven? Yeah, sure, right. Listen, the Bible, you know what the Bible, the Bible basically is many, many different altars in many different geographical locations. Many, many authors that met God and built an altar. The Bible is stories about a living God that met people. Now, for some of you who don't believe in God, listen, I'm not going to be here and be like an atheist, you know, I'm saying, okay, atheist is, atheist is dumb, even though it is. <laughs> what I'm going to tell you is, Look at the people that have met God in history. That's what the Bible is. It's a record of all these different type of altars in all different time periods. This person, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, began to manifest himself in the Jews, in Israel, and then in America, Asia, everywhere, Africa. And this person named Jesus Christ somehow invades countries. And people are building altars everywhere. What is that about? You might want to investigate those altars. Because let me tell you, in ancient Mesopotamia, when people were walking and they saw a, whole, a bunch of rocks, you know, what they knew, they, you know, they're like, oh, those are, as in, they would say, that's an altar. Someone meant God. That's why the Bible says, Peter says, you be the living what? Not letters. That's what Paul says. Paul, Peter says, you be the living stone. What is a church? A church, if you want to look at it as a building, you are the stones. You are the altars. Paul says, you be the living 
sacrifice. You are the living letters, Paul says, right? You are proof that God is living, that God is alive. See, if you don't build altars, no one will ever know that God had visited you. And that's why we take pictures. And that's why we build altars. Maybe you should make some today. And show people in the world that God, there is a living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in the descendant, Jesus came. Amen? So go make some. Now, let me put it this way to you. Let's go down. See, you can make something like an altar simply because we're so effed up as human beings, so selfish, so broken, we need constant reminders that people love us. Everyone in this room, no matter what, you're going to forget stuff. That's why you have to go back for a kick in the pants. That's why we have accountability, right? That's why you have small groups. You need a kick in the pants. Because it's like accountability is all for people that know everything but don't want to do it. I mean, you know what's wrong, but you do it. That's a character issue. I mean, if everybody, if we did everything we knew, we would never have problems. The problem is you know everything, you just don't want to do it. And that's why we have to have a place where we can go to the place to remind us about why we're living the way we're living, why we're doing what we're doing. And you know what? So let me put it this way. In 1999, this is one of my all-time favorite stories. I was friends, just platonic friends with Pastor Lydia. I had no other type of motive. I promise you, swear to God. She, in the other hand, had other motives. <laughs> but me, I had no other motive except to think of her as my friend. So in 1999, November 5th, which is her birthday, 10 years ago, I used to work at a retail clothing store called J. Crew, which I gave a large amount of discounts to people. So at this time, they were doing a special thing for a women clothing line where men can get 50% off regular price items. So I, I didn't know I was this thoughtful. <laughs> but I was. So on that week where we, were, where we went on a school trip, we were selected as leaders to do this, I don't know, whatever, whatever the hell that conference was, who cares? But you know, I bought the present, I bought this cardigan, J. Crew cardigan for her, which she still wears today. J. Crew has excellent fabric quality. <laughs> and so she got, you know, so I, I buy it, and you know, at the conference at 12 o'clock, some of us were there celebrating her birthday. At when 12 hit, I got the J. Crew box and I did it myself, you know, I put the ribbon on the thing, you know, whatever. And because I was an INTJ, and show no type of emotion. I threw the box at her. Like, it was a 12 o'clock here, happy birthday. And she got the box, you know, got it, opened it up. And she's like, oh, it's so sweet. Why'd you do this? And I was like, you know, it's your birthday, whatever, you know. It's your birthday, just enjoy the thing, right? We have 50% off sale, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, it's whatever. It's no big deal. No big deal? What's up with that? Why are you make a big deal out of it? Well, you got to make a big deal out of me giving you a present. Just leave me alone. Just enjoy the cardigan, all right? So, and, that's how you get your wife. <laughs> Can't be cheap, all right? So, just recently, this, apparent, this, this week, she put the same cardigan on in our you know, walk-in closet in our house. And she was trying on stuff, and she put it on, and, and she was telling me the story. He goes, Sam, do you remember? And I'm like, yeah, I'm the man. I'm the, I remember, you know? And she was reliving the experience of the gift that she received 10 years ago. And you know what? A memory actually can be more powerful when you wear it. 
Because when the moment happens, you might actually experience beauty, you might actually experience love, you might actually experience something wonderful, but because you're a human, you never carpet it. You miss some parts of it. So when, you, when we were wearing it in the closet, we were just friends, and now 10 years of history later, it means so much more. And you get to live that experience even more powerfully. And this is exactly what happened to Abraham here. From the Nevgez, okay, the Hebrew words, I said this a minute, listen, if you ever want to read the Bible, Nobody knows how to read the Hebrew words. It's not been spoken for centuries, okay? It's Nevgez. He went from a place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and I, where his tent had been earlier. Matthew, by the way, your, your pronunciation was excellent. Very like Nicolas Cage-like. <laughs> and then look what happens, look what happens. So Bethel and, and I, where his tent had been earlier, yeah. and where he had Bird. first built an altar, there Abraham called what? The name of the Lord. Abram went back to the place where God, the living God of the universe, the first time monotheism was ever going to be released in history, he went back to that altar to remember, yes, this God. What's his name? I have no idea. The God that promised me to bless my descendants so that every nation on the earth will be blessed. He came to that place. He wore his memory. And he called the name of the Lord. That's powerful, my man, right? That is powerful. Let me, ex let me share with you altars in your life in America will look different in Manhattan or New York. Because it's not like there's rocks just everywhere, right? You have to go to a mountain. I mean, it kind of helps when you live in the desert. There's rocks everywhere. Plenty in supply. But when you're here in a metropolitan area, when you're here, when there's no rocks, how do you build an altar? You're like, oh, interesting. Let me tell you where my altar is. My altar is at Panera. I build altars at Panera. You go, you take rocks to Panera? No, that would be weird, dummy. I build altars with coffee and pastries. <laughs> you laugh. You laugh. Ha! God doesn't laugh at that. <laughs> you think rocks is it? You, let me, I would argue that pastries is a better altar for God dead rocks. If God saw it from heaven, he would like my altar better than Abraham's. It's pastries. Who doesn't like pastries? Chocolate croissants and jelly croissants and cookies. And all you can drink coffee. They brew it fresh every hour. Panera is basically the foreshadowing of heaven. And that's where I go. And you know what? If I was honest with you, I met God in Panera for the last five years more powerfully than I have met God in a church or in my house or any other conference or retreat. I have met God more powerfully at Panera than anywhere else in the last five years of 180 history. Matter of fact, every sermon that I preach in this church comes from Panera. Panera bread, the living word. The living word comes from Panera, which is parallel. That's where the manna from heaven comes from me. Panera is where every prophetic message comes from. You go past him, how do you know what, what I'm going through? I don't. You're not that important. I don't go to your life and you know, ask questions about your life. No, God knows you're important. And that's why when God speaks to me in Panera, you hear God's voice. The name 180 Church came from Panera. That's where I went like this. Mandy plus, oh yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> it came from the journals. I was writing to God, talking to God, and God was saying that he has a dream. I want you to be part of a dream of preaching Christ and Christ doing 180s in people's lives. That came from my seat at Panera. The name 180 Inc., the company of 180 Church, came from Panera. God said, in my journals, while I was talking to God, God said, Sam, why don't you start companies that would fund the expansion of God's kingdom? So I said, start companies? God said, yeah, start companies. 
And you know what? I can send you the dates from five years of everything that happened in Manhattan, everything that happened in 180 Church on those journals, dated five years back. Father's House Project, Panera. Can you imagine me? Chocolate croissant, coffee. And God was speaking about how the picture of fighting fatherlessness in our own backyard. I got chills with my, you know, Finding Nemo soundtrack on. And as God spoke to me, deposited to me about how he wants to help and rewrite some of these stories of fatherlessness right here in our own backyard. The name went into church, went into company, Father's House Project, all from Panera. Panera is the place I go where I build my altar with pastries and coffee. That's where God meets me. If you want to transcend and overcome ungratefulness in your life, the spirit of ungratefulness, which is just our human nature. The second lesson Abraham teaches us here is simple. What is it? Is what? We got to go back to the place where the epic, epic story, you got to go back to the place where God was living and met you in your life. When you remember that God met you in a place where you were dead and he brought you back to life or whatever situation, that's where you get the faith to move on and hear God's voice again. That's where God meets you. So the question is, where is those places in your life? Go back to them. Go back to the place where God met you and make an altar, or take a picture, whatever you need to do. Because God's living presence, it's not in the place, but it's the memory of the place that solidifies what's solid that God is living in your life. And you can be grateful you see, when Abraham called on the name of the Lord, he, what he was doing was worshiping God. That's where we worship. You worship at the place where God meets you, and you're pressing me. You worship God where he's alive. That's where you lift your hands and your heart and say, God, you are alive in my life. Whatever situation I'm going through, you're alive. You can take this on. You can meet me here. Amen? Amen. So where are those places? If you don't have those places, make them. Build an altar. And take some pictures. So today's assignment class is simple. For some of you, maybe you need to go to Panera. And let me put it this way, Panera might not work for you. That's my altar. You have to come up with your own. Okay? So get, get a camera, not literally, and get some rocks and make some beautiful memories. Amen? Because, listen, if you want to live a grateful life, you have to remember that God's alive, that God will meet you at every place in your life. If you want to live a life of content and you want to wake up and ha say, I have enough, I have everything I need, I don't need anything more, you need to get cameras and rocks and start building altars and taking pictures because without that memory, God is good as dead in your life. That's why there's no power. That's why there's no freedom. That's why there's no epic story. There's nothing else being written. You see, Abraham didn't build this altar. There would be no God of, Jake, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and Jesus. The altars kept going on. The stories kept going on. And I pray, I want to invite you today to meet God in those places again. So let's all stand right now and let's pray for this. There we go. That's the new building at night. It's a beautiful sight. Now, if you continue on to be in this building and we don't get evicted again, uh, remember, if you're not in the auto debit program for all our members, our family members in our church, um, you need to give a check or PayPal today. Okay, the 22nd, the third week before the last. If you're in the auto debit program, you're fine because we're going to take your money out anyway, or we already have. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And um, so, um, so this is what it looks like. And you know, when we step into this place and you go in, you can see the potential 
of what God's going to do, there's going to be some altars and some pictures in here. I know for a fact that's going to happen. People are going to come to Christ. People are going to cry, experience all kinds of things until we have to move again. Uh, so, yeah, so today's the day you give, or uh, if you haven't joined the auto debit program, you can get the email again. Um, so uh, that's today. So that's what it looks like, and we're going to thank the Lord as we pray before the Lord. And uh, uh, again, if you are giving offering, you know, we don't collect it during service. We, we want people to come and hear the gospel for free. And then when they come into Christ, pay for other people to hear the gospel. Um, so we're going to pray for that. You can give at 180church.tv or at the info booth as you leave. Um, lastly, right now it's so exciting because, you know, every week I'm hearing emails and through staff and through people that God is just beginning conversations about Jesus. That's what our church is about, right? The church is about Jesus. Jesus from which angle? From Jesus from every angle possible. Because Jesus changes everything. So let's continue to pray for those conversations and those verges. And then let's have a blessed Sunday today. Let's pray together. God, we come before you today. We want to thank you for this new building that you've given us. And how our people um, stepped it up and sacrificed and gave. And we can afford it. And we can uh, start a new chapter in building the Father's House Project. And, and really looking after the fatherless and the motherless. And creating more memories. That are so precious to you. So we pray that for blessing on that. We pray that people would give even more to this project to bless you. So we want to thank you, God, for the resources that you've given to us. That's all yours. So we give back to you, remembering and keeping you in the center of our life. Lord, will you remember the people that we're talking to about Christ? And will you bring them in your time into the family of God with us? So, Lord, we thank you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.